Hi, I'm Alex Asher, CEO of LearnCube, and I'm here again with Tom Jones. Now, what we're going to be talking about is uh, teaching strategies, particularly for online language teaching. Now, Tom, there are some three kind of key areas that you want to talk about when we're talking about these online teaching strategies. Uh, one was going to be on the idea of um, this before, during, and after segment in a class and how we can think about those as helping each other and, and the combinations we can create. The second thing that we were going to talk about is variety and how we add variety as a bit of spice of life, but also a spice to the online classroom. And the third thing that we were going to talk about was actually this idea of ensuring interaction is, is really embedded into the curriculum, into the content, into the class structure. So those are the three areas that we were going to talk about. Do you want to just start us off with that first one? What is it about the class structure that's different online? And, and why do we even need to think about this before, during and after component? I think for three reasons, really. Online classes are often shorter, so we yeah. don't have that kind of exposure. But online classes tend to be a place where students are much much more able to not engage because they aren't physically there it's much easier to sort of tune out and i think the third thing is that students in online classes are you know either really really keen really really desperate to be there or much you know much that short attention span is is even shorter online you know because they will kind of click in click out or click in and turn off you know in a way that in a physical classroom they, they can't as much. So I suppose those three things are the big ones. You know? But overarching all of it, and exactly as you said before, the three things that we're looking at today, all of those things and the thing that brings them all together is motivation. So when you talk about motivation, how does that influence what happens in those three buckets, the before, during and after part of the class? So I'll often send students a task uh, and some sort of stimuli. So they'll get like a video, they'll get something they have to respond to. Uh, what I've often done is sent a video and then I've organized a very quick, uh, possibly five, 10 minute quiz session where I'll just ask the group questions or even one-on-one -on -one, depending on the size of the group about what they've seen in the stimulus and you know what they've understood from that. And that'll depend according to their level and all this sort of stuff. But it allows me when I've got new students to test their levels of motivation and see how involved they are because if they bother to engage if they bother to look at the material if they bother to turn up and give answers all of those give us information on how motivated they are um but i think it's also the thing about the sort of teaser you know the trailer to kind of get them in and get them thinking oh yeah hang on i want to go there and i want to turn up and i want to you know invest myself in this in terms of time and energy that makes a lot of sense because as you say in an in-person class, I mean, particularly the way that language schools were operating, you know, in a traditional sense, they were there for hours, right? Like six, six hours or eight hours. Yeah. So there wasn't a need to have the sort of outside of the classroom kind of exposure because they could do a lot of that work there. That's what they were there for. With online, because you don't have attention for as long, it's very important to create activities and, and ways for them to progress if they wish to outside of the class. And depending on that motivation level is how much you should really give them, right? Uh, and actually probably, uh, what's your approach here, Tom? Would you say kind of give them a little bit, see if it, if it works, build it and build up? Or would you start from the biggest amount, see if they do any of it and then retract? <laughs> um, I, tell you, I tend to start with a small amount because I think, uh, people can respond to that in a variety of ways and they can give you really full responses which show you they can deal with more and want more uh, or you know minimal minimal and often in the same group you'll get some people doing huge amounts some people doing tiny amounts and you know finding a happy medium that makes a lot of sense to me and so I, I think I understand how we can kind of treat those sort of different I mean to be fair it seems like we've got two particular personas there one that are super motivated are going to do all of the work before the class in which case you've got a lot more opportunities about what you could do in the class particularly these ideas of flipped classrooms and all sorts of things can make sense and then look i'm sure every language school's got them and they're probably not a small minority either a lot of people don't want to do the work before class and are relying on doing a lot more in the class and so with those people it's more of a teaser 
kind of what you were saying there, a bit of a trailer, getting them hooked, getting them excited before the class. So at least the stuff that they're doing in the class, they're getting absolute full impact. Definitely, because it is that short, sharp shock, I think, that is really important in terms of language learning, but also in terms of um, students' kind of involvement, engagement, and, and investment, where they're kind of thinking, right, I'll turn up and I'll do the work and I'll arrive full of ideas and probably coffee. Sounds good. So in the class, it's going to depend on where those where those buckets if they're highly highly uh, motivated different story to if they're not as motivated and they need a bit more hand holding inside the class so i think i understand that and then the same thing will happen on the outside of that if they're hyper motivated it's probably going to be reinforcement about what's done if they're not motivated at all it might just be uh, what would you do for those sorts of users the people that are more just turn up and do it yeah i, I i'd often give them um give them elements to complete on a daily basis so that they've got tiny elements that are a few minutes of work every day rather than one chunk that they have to produce over four or five days between classes um because i find that kind of prod is useful um irritating in some cases for some students but useful because it gets them to do stuff and i think it's what we've talked about before that kind of mental gym and we as, as online teachers are a kind of gym where people have to it's great that you've come but you have to do stuff when you're there but you also have to do stuff when you're at home you know and you have to warm up and you have to warm down because if not it's going to hurt you know? that, that makes a lot of sense and i think a, a similar analogy is the fact that before in a traditional sort of language school you would do the warm-up and the finish and the warm down yeah, at yeah. the school and that was fine but online you have to maybe build those same elements but rather than using the one small amount of time you have together for all of those pieces, it's probably going to be, I need you to start and finish earlier and later, right? So that yeah. we can make the most of our time. So that's great. So that I think does help me understand how you then might create content to kind of fit that. The second thing was this idea on variety and variability and sort of different stimulus. Tell me about your thoughts on, when you're creating content, how to think about what to use, go from there. I think, you know, it's, it's all about the cocktail, isn't it? But um, some people are going to want to learn, you know, audio, visual, kinesthetic, and emotionally, you know, there's going to be a whole variety of people in the room that are going to respond to different things. And as a result, I think it's really important when preparing online classes to give elements of all of those things and change what we do very quickly because we've only got a short time. and you know in essence parts of the class will work well for a kinesthetic learner or for an audio learner or a visual learner um but all of the class will kind of work for everybody you know um some people will respond better to elements than others but everybody will get something if we vary it yeah i mean it seems like in a way you're hedging your bit bits right like regardless yes. of whether some people might sometimes respond really well to a video or a text or an audio that may change from lesson to lesson from topic to topic potentially Definitely. but by adding different stimulus you're creating little break points in people's attention giving their, their brain just something else new to hold on to so that they don't get stale and see that kind of decline in, in motivation so i mean that's that makes very sense well, you know, what I often feel is if we do the teaser right and if we do that kind of motivational stuff right, then we give out this variety of short elements during the class that they will hopefully then take away and expand on themselves. Do you know what I mean? So we do an exercise or we look at a topic and they will then be inspired to take that away and work on it themselves. Because that is always what you want to do as a teacher, I think, is, is make yourself progressively redundant. You know, because your learner is able to learn actively and, and take away what they've done. Yeah, I like that. And it also, you're hopefully then helping the, the learner themselves understand how to teach themselves, right? Like, hey, you know, I, I went through this YouTube video, I created some, some questions, and then, I, and then I applied that language in a, in a way. And I, I think that could be applied in a kind of self-learning way as well, right? Definitely. Really important. Because I think that, you know, as soon as students grasp the fact that they are the key to their own learning um, that, you know, I am not Harry Potter and I can't just put it in their head. You know, they've actually got to do work and learn themselves as soon as they grasp that. Um, and I, so basically I'm throwing stuff at them to try and get them to kind of go, Oh, hang on. Right. I can do this. I can take this forward. You know? And so, uh, you know, the nice thing I think is that you can really make it bespoke online in a way that with a, a larger group physically face to face, you can't, 
in that some people will want more from you and they will ask for specific tasks and you've got the breakout room and you've got those things which i think are really key yeah and also i think one point that i've seen very important it's just like everything it's complicated but it's about balance and it's about simplicity and getting that right balance between there's a nut like you can say oh it's really simple all i do is i talk to my students it's like that's great but that's only one way that you're kind of teaching them and interacting with them like after a while students are going to want something different uh or, or at least you know that's how our brains work you know like how, how can you teach me in different ways like that's i think what a, a student would expect so and then on the other side super technical you know super kind of tech savvy but like to the extra extreme it's like oh we're going to go through a different video every 30 seconds i've got this audio thing i want oh. you to go to this tool and then i'm yeah. so busy going in and out of things that i get lost yeah. um i mean some software you know LearnCube included are very good at a very seamless transition because every transition that has a friction point you, you, you're losing people but if you keep that if you're prepared in a way that makes that transition really seamless and really easy you're able to get the best of technology but without those massive like oh just wait i've just got to put in the projector oh no it's no power oh, i need to find the other cable it's that kind of thing you don't I mean, want to have that experience yeah 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 no true and i think you know just as like i have to stand up and move because i've been sat down i think that kinesthetic thing of getting students to to actually move getting students to do something is really important which moves on to the third point and the third point is that thing you were saying about setup you know that thing you were saying about um and interaction yeah interaction because what we often do and i think there's a lot of kind of fashion within the world of, of education to make students feel comfortable to make them feel safe and that's great and that's a nice thing um but that's not what language learning is about and that's not what speaking a foreign language is about speaking a foreign language is frightening and speaking a foreign language is challenging and speaking a foreign language is difficult so i like to kind of reproduce that as much as possible by you know and, and that's where the gift of online classrooms i think is really helpful because there's nowhere to hide because we are able to say right your turn you're up and they're on you know and what's interesting to me is how difficult that is for students and how we have to kind of say it's great totally understand that it's difficult a lot of people don't like doing this but on you go because it's lovely that you're learning language but if you're not speaking it doesn't matter and actually if we're not speaking and we're not interacting why bother coming to the class do you yeah. know what i mean it's just an academic experience of kind of doing a crossword then isn't it you know um, well, yeah. it's it's i mean we're very exposed to it since we work with so many different schools but people are there for speaking like that's the number one thing that people are going to need help. We've talked about it before. A lot of the transactional written pieces of writing a language are going to become less and less valuable. The speaking component is what people pay money for. Uh, yeah. As an employer, as an education, uh, you know, if you're an education uh, university, I'm pretty sure it's going to be, you know, can I communicate with this person? Is this person going to be able to ask questions and interact with other students, other teachers, or are they going to, what, I mean, I still don't think people are going to like, oh, sorry, can I just text you what I want to ask? You know, like, uh, you know, you need to have a level of fluency and that's why speaking is so important. It's also why all of the most successful online schools are particularly, you know, making a big deal of the fact that you're going to be learning how to speak. And the only way to learn how to speak is by practicing. They're speaking. Yeah, yeah, definitely true. Totally true. And I think that's a really, really key element, isn't it, to language learning, but online language learning, because it's great that you can do self-study it's great that you can do all of these you know all of these things which are very very kind of user-friendly and very very false because that's not really what happens you know and you you go face to face with somebody and you have to use the language or you're on the end of the phone and or you're on a video call um and you can do it or you can't you know you can speak or you can't and there's no middle ground and there's no showing somebody a piece of paper that says you're quite good you know um and it is the magic moment i think is is actual production of a foreign language so making students feel challenged and making them feel uncomfortable you know it is is key because that's how it feels Do you know yeah. what I mean? so i think what i find helps with that often is providing them with stimulus that is sometimes allowing them to talk about things that are maybe not them you know so students for example from um 
you know, to pick a, a nation, Japan, Japanese students have often struggled with um, the kind of Western thing of asking what your opinion about a thing is. Not because they don't have opinions, because obviously they do, but they've got a lot of respect for teachers. So me saying, hey, what do you reckon? And they go, I don't know what the answer is. And I'm saying, no, no, it's whatever you think it is, it's fine. And out of respect for me, they won't say, well, actually, no, I think this is rubbish. Um, you know, and, and so being able to do that online where they're able to respond to stuff through stimulus where it's kind of not them talking. So we're saying we're reading something or we're watching a video and they're saying, well, this person has said this. This person is thinking that really helps students uh, who find production difficult when it's their own stuff. You know? I, I like that. And so you can position content to help facilitate interaction and speaking in a couple of different ways. The first thing is also not taking the human out, like don't rely on the system to make the student speak. It's the job of the teacher, right? Like your job is to bring out the, the, the speaking confidence of these students. So maybe setting those expectations up front is really helpful. Definitely, totally agree, totally agree. Because, you know, saying to them early on, and it's that, it is the gym element again, isn't it, of that personal trainer of saying, you know, you're gonna have to do hard work when they start of saying, look, I'm really sorry, but this is going to be you and you have to talk and you have to prepare and you have to work hard. And if you don't, don't come, you know, <laughs> and we've said that thing before about, you know, the way I always push students. And it's interesting because I think uh, students will often resist initially and will often complain initially about, you know, the fact that they're being driven in that sense, um, but will always really be very grateful afterwards when they see the things they've learned. And that, you know, moves on to what you'd said before about, um, about syllabus and about measurement of, of how students have progressed and looking at how they've done that, uh, which obviously is much easier online. Yeah, and I think that the way that we'd also tie this together is also you can help with that interaction by helping them feel comfortable in that before part of the class. So when they come to class, they maybe know, some, hey, these are some safe areas that I can probably prepare for so that, I'm starting at a place of comfort and then my teacher might take me to a, a slightly more challenging part that's slightly outside of my comfort zone. And I'm okay with that because my teacher, I trust that teacher. So I think there is very, a lot of similarities with a personal trainer in that way. Yeah, yeah definitely. And you know, similarly, I think the, the idea that they're confronted with a lot of variety because obviously they need to work their whole body. They need to work their whole mind, you know? Um, so if they are an audio learner, they still need to take things in visually because that's what's for dinner, you know, <laughs> that there, there isn't an element at which one can stand up at work and say, that pie chart's great, but I can't really read it. So can you just talk me through it? Cause that's not how life works. So putting people in positions where they take things in in different ways, I think it is, is useful for them. And us. Yeah, absolutely. So what we've talked about today is um, chunking up your the way that you structure your classes online to having maybe a before, during and after component to them, whether depending you know, it's, it's going to depend on how big those are, depending on the motivation, the setup and a whole bunch of things. But testing those three things out, I think is really helpful. The second thing we talked a lot about was variety in the classroom. So using multimedia, using YouTube video, using, um, you know, websites using various other tools but maybe not overdoing it so that it's so complicated and creating lots of potential rooms for failure we don't want to create lots of potential fail points we want to keep things interesting enough that they're not disengaging after just an hour monologue from their teacher but at least varied enough that it's not like you know one thing after the other that it's sort of overwhelming and then the last thing we talked about is interactivity Speaking is the highest and most valued part of the entire lesson, how to maximize that time and using content to kind of draw that out. And of course, leaving the teacher to set the expectations and set the pace of the class and maybe set the challenge level. Yeah, yeah that's really spot on, isn't it? Because it is, it's momentum, it's motivation and it's production. Tom, this was fantastic, an absolute pleasure. And again, so full of hidden gems there. So if you're listening in, uh, I hope you've enjoyed it too. And please make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel and you're going to learn more in our LearnCube University that's also coming out too. Thanks very much. Perfect. Thanks so much. Pleasure. Cheers.